A few weeks back, my wife and I had a bit of a disagreement. Nothing major. She said something. I said, why would you say that? She said, what do you think I'm saying? I said, blah, blah. She said, no, no, no. I'm saying this instead. Oh, we smoothed it over and moved on. A few hours later, my wife pulled me aside and asked me why I misinterpreted what she said. We've been married 18 years. We're at the point in our relationship we can finish each other's sentences. Normally, I'm very good at figuring out what she's trying to say. On top of that, I have pretty thick skin. Nine times out of ten, even if she had said what I thought she said, it wouldn't have bothered me. I told her, you remember that thing you said and did the day before? That's the context why I interpreted what you said today. After a long, awkward silence while she thought through what I said, she turned to me, and you know what she said? I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention. You all know what my response was? I'm sorry, I should have talked to you yesterday. Why am I telling you all this story besides bragging on my wife? She's a lot more than a pretty face. The reason? Humility. One of my areas of expertise is aesthetics, beauty. And one of the most important factors that goes into our evaluation of somebody else's beauty, how much we like them. And one of the most appealing personality traits a person can have, causing us to like them more, which in turn causes us to find them more physically attractive, humility. I would argue one of the most important lessons of the hero's journey is humility. The hero has flaws, which causes them to make mistakes. Before they can fix their mistakes, they first have to address the flaws, which causes them to become a better person, allowing them to do the heroic deed. All of this is brought about by learning humility. I've been whinging on about the rings of power, gleefully pointing out all the flaws and their allegiance. But there's something that's been bothering me I couldn't quite put my finger on. Finally, it's dawned on me. Humility. Or in this case, lack of humility. To make my point, I'm going to have to get a little esoteric with you all here for a second. Talk about why all throughout history, art has been associated with the mystical, the magical, the sacred. When you create something entirely new that has never existed before, you're taking on an aspect of God or the gods, depending on the faith. That means a work of art represents the divine or the sacred. Even today, art is still treated with respect because it's still viewed as an act of creation. Every single work of art is special because it's unique. It can never be recreated. It can be copied, but it can never be recreated. Why is Peter Jackson's film adaptation so beloved despite its flaws? A lot of people will say, well, it's because Jackson kept the spirit of Tolkien. I'll agree with that argument. But how? Respect and humility. They didn't have the arrogance and hubris to think they could improve or replace Tolkien's work. They had the humility to recognize they were creating something new within the constraints of somebody else's creation. The Rings of Power? Humility? <laughs> The writers of the Rings of Power don't understand the difference between the concepts of humility and humiliation. The writers of the Rings of Power think it is humiliating to constrain their genius within the confines of somebody else's creation, especially if that creation is full of bigotry and hatred. The writers are desperate to discredit Tolkien, to prove there's no such thing as good and evil. There are no heroes. It's all just perspective. Those trying to discredit Tolkien always fall back on the one same argument. It's what they think is their ace in the hole. They're Tolkien kryptonite. It's the argument that George R. R. Martin articulated in his comments at Trinity College Dublin. Aragorn is no hero. He committed genocide against the orcs. Guess what argument makes this appearance in episode 6? Make no mistake about it, they've been building to this. Earlier episodes, we saw loving orc families. Mommy orc, 
Daddy Orc, lovingly cradling little Uglug. Orcs don't want war. All they want is a piece of the Mordor dream. Their own hovel with its skull-encrusted fence, two Uglugs, 1.5 wargs. They're not exactly subtle with the argument either. After Gladriel agrees to help Adar hunt down Sauron, Adar asks, what about after Sauron? What then? Galadriel asks, what do you mean? Adar says, you're high king. He will never let us live in peace. He will hunt us down, slaughter all of us. Adar has read The Lord of the Rings. He knows how this story ends. So he and the orcs are justified in everything they do because thousands of years in the future, some guy is going to slaughter their descendants because of all the evil things they did. But again, they're justified in doing because they know they're going to be slaughtered thousands of years in the future. This is taking the end justifies the means to a whole new level. To beat you over the head with the symbolism, Kazadum is shown to be a dark, dank, dirty, grubby place, no different than any orc city. Dwarves, orcs, men, they're all the same, no difference. Elves, they're just a higher class of scum. You want to try to ignore the symbolism? The writers are just going to have Celebrimbor come right out and say it. Men are by nature selfish, self-centered, corrupt, and evil. There's no way they will ever produce a just, noble king. Ha! Never happen. George R. R. Martin and the writers of the Rings of Power are making a circular argument. We don't believe in an objective good or evil because whether any particular act is good or evil is entirely dependent upon the perspective of the people involved. If there is no objective good, there can't be a good king. Therefore, Aragorn can't be a good king. Aragorn's not a good king because from the orcs' perspective, what Aragorn does, wiping out the orcs, is evil. Proving Aragorn's not a good king, proving there are no good kings, thus proving there is no objective good and bad. This is also a fate argument. We are born evil, and we can never break free from being evil. Never mind that the same people who are saying there is no objective good and evil are simultaneously saying we are fated to be evil. Never mind that the same people who are saying there is no objective right and wrong are simultaneously saying we are right and you are wrong. Cognitive dissonance is a powerful thing, my friends. And you all see a problem with this argument? J.R.R. Tolkien rejected the idea of fate. The whole point of the Lord of the Rings was free will. Heroicism was everyday people choosing every moment of every day to do good, to consciously reject doing evil each decision along the way. Using your worldview to critique a work of art? Nothing wrong with that. That's fair game. Where you start to run into problems, though, is when you try to impose your worldview on how the artist chose to create that work of art. This is a classic example of the why didn't you do something else argument. Why did you write about free will, people doing good, being just, being noble, when you should have written about fate, people being evil, morally ambiguous, nihilism? It's a complete lack of humility, arrogance. We know we are right. We know you're wrong. And we know we're doing the right thing by imposing our values on you. And if we have to destroy something you love in the process, take that, ifs and phobes. Back to humility and the hero's journey. As I said earlier, humility is a trait that we find desirable. It makes us like the person more, and we find the person more attractive. There's another added benefit of having a hero show humility. When somebody has flaws and makes mistakes, but they overcome those flaws and mistakes, it makes them relatable. The hero becomes inspirational. They act like a mirror, showing us how we can become better people ourselves. Modern intersectional theory demands that a woman can never be shown in a negative light, ever. 
It also insists a woman must be right at all times, and the woman has to be the prime mover, the one driving the story forward. Your story? Do what you want. You can make that work, kind of, sort of, but you can make it work. If you're adapting an existing story, you have to make characters work within a known plot. <laughs> and things get really bizarre really fast if you have to make your women characters always right at every given moment. Good old Disa. Because of her hectoring, badgering, and browbeating, Prince Durin has a confrontation with his father. Ends up Prince Durin and his family are disowned. Disa declares, we will force your father to acknowledge us. So she then hectors, badgers, and browbeats him to go talk to the elves, get their help in forcing his father to acknowledge them. Celebrimbor and Sauron say, sure, we can help. We have this ring. Take it. Prince Durin says, no, nah, there's something fishy here. No, thank you. Disa hectored, badgered, browbeat Prince Durin into taking the ring because she wanted the power. This ring will allow us to force your father to do what I, <clears throat> I mean, we want. Once King Durin has the ring, suddenly Disa decides, oh, wait a minute. That ring might not be such a good thing. It might be evil. Disa hectors, badgers, and browbeats Prince Stern into going and confronting his father, demanding, take off that evil ring, destroy it before it's too late. That just gives Prince Stern in even more trouble with his father. In episode 6, Disa confronts Prince Stern, announces, we have to rebel. Prince Stern breaks down and cries, I can't do it, he's my dad. Disa just hectors, badgers, and browbeats him. Sensing a trend yet? Disa says, suck it up. We're going to rebel, so deal with it. Prince Doran's response, I know you're right. Let's do it. And the icing on the cake? Disa starts the rebellion all by herself, with Prince Doran cowering behind some rocks off to one side. We're going to ignore the fact that that Disa brought the ring to Khazad Doom and then woke up the Balrog. So whatever happens in Khazad Doom is Disa's fault. If you insist that Disa has to be right in every one of her interactions with Prince Durin, she doesn't look strong, powerful, and independent. It looks like she intentionally manipulated Prince Durin, put him into a position where he was forced to rebel. It makes Disa look pretty dang evil. And not to mention, she emasculates Prince Durin every step along the way. But then again, the writers of the Rings of Power consider emasculating male characters a good thing. Speaking of emasculation, there's poor old Elendil. Elendil is put on trial. The usurper says, you will acknowledge my power or you will face the consequences. Elendil says, I follow the rightful queen. She has my loyalty, so you can piss off. The usurper says, oh yeah? We're going to throw you to the Kraken. That will decide your fate. Yeah, I know it's not called a Kraken in the show, but it's a Kraken. Elendil is thrown into a cell to await his fate. His daughter shows up, begs, pleads, throws herself on his chest, weeping. Please, father, just submit. Declare your loyalty to the usurper. Your life will be spared for me. Elendil's daughter is on the side of the usurper. But remember, the woman has to be right in every situation. So the scene portrays it as she's the reasonable one and Elendil's the asshole. As the daughter's leaving, Queen Regent Muriel shows up. And she also begs, pleads, weeps. Please just submit to the usurper for me. And again, the scene presents it as Muriel is being the kind, noble, just one. And Elendil's this arrogant asshole. Let's think this through for a minute. 
Elendil is so loyal to his queen, he's willing to die for her. And we're supposed to despise him for that? <laughs> the next day, they bring Elendil out, and he's ready to face the Kraken. You guessed it. At the very last moment, Muriel steps out and announces, No, I will make the sacrifice. She goes into the pool, and the Kraken throws her back out, proving somebody's innocent. The rules state Muriel has to drive the story forward, so she has to face the Kraken. But it screws up the whole story. A key component of the hero's journey, the hero must be willing to risk their lives to preserve their principles, their integrity. Alindiel stands up for his principles. He's thrown in jail for his principles. And he's standing there ready to risk his life. And at the very last moment, it's taken away from him by a glory hound. Elendil is denied the opportunity to stand up for his principles. He's denied the opportunity to clear his name. And he's emasculated all in one fell swoop. Facing the Kraken is a trial by combat. The story is set up so that when Elendil faces the Kraken, he is thrown back, thus clearing his name and, by extension, proving that Muriel is the rightful queen. When Muriel steps in to take Elendil's place, the Kraken has no legitimate reason to throw her back, outside of the fact that the rules state the woman has to be right. The story no longer makes any sense. We come back to humility. When somebody has to always be right, no matter the circumstance, that ain't humility. You remove humility from the hero's journey, and the hero becomes evil. As I said earlier, humility is a desirable human trait. We like people who have humility. People without humility, we don't like very much. There's one thing I can say about the rings of power, top to bottom, absolutely has no humility. No wonder no one finds the rings of power pleasing to the eye. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If y'all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And maybe consider becoming a member. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.